Hey folks, good afternoon. We're about to get ready for the lightning talks, but before, Neil has a quick announcement for all of you. So please, let's welcome Neil to the stage. Hello. I hope this works. Uh, no, it doesn't. Oh God. As per usual, technical difficulties at a technical conference. We're not AV engineers. Or are there any in the audience? You wanna get up here? Ah, there's something here. Maybe I'll just leave it like that. Um, so yeah, uh, you may have heard this this morning quickly, it was quickly announced, but uh, I basically made this uh, video game uh, where you can sail around the world and actually you play with this video game uh, not with your hands, but with a Python program. Uh, so uh, there you start from France, and you have a little ship, and there's wind, and you have to try and get around the world. Uh, there's uh, two checkpoints that you have to reach, and then you have to get back home. Um, there's basically, uh, yeah, um, if you want to participate, don't be scared. Uh, if you think you're not good enough at Python, it's actually really simple. It's mostly about just plotting a course. And um, you are given a template code that already works, so that also helps. And you can also ask a friend and submit as a team. That's also fine. And um, there's a QR code with a link to the uh, repository where all the game rules, and that crashed again. I should just not go full screen. Have about yeah, I'll just leave it like that. Uh, so you have about two days, two and a half days to work on this, and then we'll do a tournament on Friday afternoon at one o'clock in the open space, where we'll run all the submissions and everyone will compete against each other. And there are prizes for the winners. Thank you very much. If you couldn't grab the QR code, there's also information on Discord, so please do check that. And also on the website. And also everywhere. And also find Neil. He'll be happy to talk about it for sure. Jody, how do you feel about lightning talks? I think they are one of the most chaotic, fun parts of a conference. I feel like this is where the Python conference really shows its creative side. So absolutely. Do you guys all know the saying, I came for the language, I stayed for the... Lightning talks, absolutely. That's, that's how I feel about this. That's how I feel about this. Alrighty, I think, do we want to, oh, we, we need to, to tell them the rules. Yes. I was about to. No, no, we yeah. don't like anarchy. There needs to be some, some I rules. live in Germany, there needs to be rules. Of course. Yes. I don't live in Germany, but some rules sometimes are helpful. Mm. So. Five minutes, strictly enforced. If the speaker overruns, what do we do? Exactly. We don't boo them off stage, we don't do that here. We enthusiastically clap them off the stage to thank them for their time. Also, like Valerio usually says, lightning talks, they're about anything. Everyone is welcome, all experiences are welcome, all feelings are welcome. You're here to talk about something you're passionate about. It does not necessarily have to be Python. Did I miss anything? I think we're good. Did we miss anything? Are you ready? I said, are you ready? Yeah. Then who's our first speaker? As our first speaker, let's welcome Jakob as he tells us a little bit about Czech wines. So if you're like me, when you thought, think about Czechia, you think beer. And that's a really fascinating story, but not the one I'm going to tell today. Czechia has three parts to it. It's Bohemia, it's Silesia, and it's Moravia. Silesia uh, is uh, a very small part, and the rivers there empty into the Baltic Sea, 
in Bohemia, the river uh, Voltava, which goes through Prague, empties into the North Sea, and in Moravia, there is the Moravia River, which goes to the Danube, and then uh, goes into the Black Sea. And uh, that happens in the vicinity of uh, Bratislava and Vienna. And uh, the uh, Danube was the border of the Roman Empire uh, around this area. And they had problems with, with Germanic tribes that used to live in this area. So the Romans sent their legions across the Danube to establish an area where they pacified uh, the G Germans. And by order of the emperor, they were allowed to plant wine there in the year 272. And wine has been growing in this area in Moravia, which is south of the city of Brno, since then. So we've had uh, the period when the Germans left, and we got the Czech people into the area, and then we've had the period of the Holy Roman Empire and the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And that's the story of how wine came into Czechia. So they're still growing wine. They have the types of grapes that uh, are common in Austria and Serbia and places like that. And uh, then they have even developed their own grapes. So there is something called Cabernet Moravia, which is a blend between, uh, or a crossing between uh, the grape uh, Zweigelt, which is uh, an ancient Austrian uh, grape, and Cabernet Sauvignon, which is what they grow in Bordeaux. And this is actually a recent grape. It uh, was invented or created in 1975. And Czechia makes really good wines. But they're not known all that much around the world. Uh, I think this is a pity, so I would like you to uh, investigate the area. <laughs> buy, buy, buy some Czech wines, bring home, and try them out, because they're really good. Thank you. I asked Jody to help me out, but then I didn't give Jody the list of speakers. <laughs> so how, how is Jody supposed to help me? Please, yes, please, Inácio. So I'm welcoming on stage Inácio, a fellow Portuguese-speaking uh, person. And Inácio is going to tell us how you can create a Python community with friends. Let's give him a big round of applause. So, in early 2024, I was in Huon, north of France, at this cafe, and I told to my wife, if I had more social capital, I would organize at my work, not a not a Python meetup big as Aero Python, but a small Python meetup at my work. She told me, you don't need that, just do it. <laughs> so I work at Institut Curie, Curie Institute. Here's the Paris unity, so the idea was to organize AMTAP over there. The first thing I did, as a postdoctoral researcher, I talked to my supervisor. She allowed me to do it, and I created an opinion poll to Curry people, 
asking if they were interested, when would they like to make the conference? They answered, and I, later I opened a CFP for people to send in talks. We received three talks, one, one of them was mine, <laughs> and two of them were, were from I I invited people that, that I met. Uh, and after doing that, we organized an organization committee because an uh, event you must do in a team, not alone. So Lucy is from my team at Kuhi, Thibault is from a neighbor team at Kuhi, and Mami is from the Kuhi Tech Bioinformatics. So once we had a committee, we could organize the event. And this is, these two guys are the, were the invited speakers, Ulysse Marteau from Oakin, a bioinformatics company in Paris, and Giovanni Paglia from SCVerse, a Python community from Germany, which designs technologies and Python packages for single cell genomics, basically. <clears throat> they, they gave awesome tools, they talks at the meeting. This is the title of our meetup, Curry Python. Meeting the idea was to get together the getting together Python people from Institute Curie to make a meetup. Here we have some photos of the talks. I, I gave a talk about Python events. Uh, PF Mehon gave about explainable AI. Ulis Marto about PyD62 here. Uh, Giovanni Paya about the SC verse. Here a photo of the committee with the invited speakers. We had a catering funded by EuroPython, which gave us a lot of support regarding that. And because of that, I'd like to send a, a Brazil sized thank you to, in, as I live in France, merci beaucoup, in Portuguese, muito obrigado, to Lais Carvalho, Fannis, and Vaiba from EuroPython in helping to make the catering happen. <clears throat> And the main lessons learned were, was start small, start with your local community. People hire the technology, it's the Python Brazil motor, it's the most important message you must take home from this lightning talk. Without people, there's nothing. And the first time, you always, you always miss something, that's why we try to do a second edition, a little bit bigger. And don't give up. At many moments, I wanted to give up because there were many issues regarding the catering, but in the end of the day, everything ran very right, so don't give up. And it's a rewarding experience because the talks at this meetup were Euro Python level talks, really. Uh, and I, I also li would like to dedicate this lightning talk to the person that uh, supported me at first, and, and without her, I would, I would not be even here. My wife. Thank you very much. Muito obrigado, Inácio. Thank you so much. So, next up we have Fabrizio. Tell us about making cron expressions readable again. A big round of applause, please. So let me see if this is. I was told that it's a bit of a random thing if it works or not. So it's kind of a. Should it just go? No. I'm not sure. Let me see. I'm not really seeing any signal from yours. Okay. I was there's some USB C from the book. This is when the joke, jokes come, huh? We need a Python joke. Let's see. Ah, that's promising. Hey. 
There you go. Great. Perfect. So, hi everybody. My name is Fabrizio. I live and work in Hamburg as a data scientist there. And um, today I wanted to share with you a little project I put together a few months ago. It's been useful for me, and I figured it might be helpful for some of you folks as well. So, um, do we have any NeoVim users here? The editor NeoVim users? A few hands up. Cool, cool. Um, so, what I wanted to tell you about is basically a plugin, some extension in its functionality to, as the title says, make cron expressions readable again. So, let's see what they are and what I mean by that. So, this is an example of a configuration file that you might have behind a GitHub workflow, for example, and you want to schedule this job. You want to tell this machine with which frequency to run the job. For example, you might want to say I want to run every day at 12 a.m., or I might, I might want to run every second day at 2, 3, 4 p.m., I might want to run every second day of the third week of the month, of the last month of the year, of the year 2022, 24, whatever. So as you see, these, kind of, these expressions are very ex expressive, but they get tricky, and whenever I look at them, I feel a bit more like that. So what some people do, at least I do, uh, is you copy this string, so th uh, the cron expression that you see after the word cron, and you go to some website that allows you, that, that tells you, that translates this string into a human readable, as if people, people <laughs> are following along, and uh, then you start kind of tweaking the things, and when you find the string that you actually wanted to, then you go back to your editor, you paste it there, and cross your fingers that everything is, is working fine. But um, yeah, so that process is, is very cumbersome. By that time, I already checked Twitter three or four times, the newspapers. I mean, context switching is, is a problem. So it'd be nice to have everything in the editor, so you just, just keep working on your flow, and that's exactly what this plugin allows you to do. So let's see it in action. Here I have a file, and as you see, as I type, you, it will detect the cron expression and render the human readable translation. So for example, every minute or every second, in that case, it will try to find all of them. So this is a more complicated example with many expressions. You can turn it off. There will be a command there, cron explain, disable, they're off. You can keep on editing your file. At some point, you might turn them on again, and they should just work. So that's basically the functionality. And this is all the configuration that you need to make it work. Out of the box, just what you just saw. Um, there's one little dependency you need because this is not a parser or a checker itself. Um, but again, this is all you need to paste into your configuration. Um, if you have a few more minutes, you can spend some time, make it look nicer, or even you are, write your own, say, parser or current expression checker if you want in Python or in Lua, whatever language you want. And Chronix is basically kind of a framework that would allow you to stitch that together and make that still work. So that's basically what I wanted to show you. Here is a QR code for linking to, to, the, to the repo. There, there is code. There is hopefully extensive documentation there to get you started. And yeah, let me know if you find it useful. Thank you very much. Can I ask them something? Mm. Do you guys know the game Where's Waldo? Yeah. Let's play a variant of that. Let's play Where's Mark Smith? <laughs> and, okay, and while we wait for, well, we already found Mark, but there's Austin that was set up. Who's going to get here first? Okay, so Mark is here first. Alrighty. So then let's welcome Mark. I, I couldn't find Mark. <laughs> Nobody um, said they were looking for me. While Mark sets up, uh, his topic is searching for celebrities with your face. I also did look up a Python joke, but I got back a compliment instead. 
Python, a Python string is a collection of characters, much like yourselves. Aww. <laughs> go ahead. Shall I go? OK. Um, yeah, I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes uh, talking about something slightly silly that I made. Um, if anybody knows me here, they know that I make silly things. I do silly things with Python. Uh, I'm not sure why that's asked me to connect, anyway. Uh, there we go. So it's, I built this for, uh, to work on a mobile, so it's all a bit vertical. Uh, I'm just going to have to refresh this because the camera component doesn't, uh, doesn't like it when my laptop sleeps. OK, so that's me. I uh, apologize for my face being so big on the screen. Um, and I'm just about to take a selfie. I feel like you're looming down on us. <laughs> And now I can look up my celebrity lookalike in a database that we have. Um, so this is using AI. I don't know exactly what results it's going to come up with, which is you know, making a live demo even more stressful than it would normally be. Uh, it also takes a little while, and it uses a network. So you know, taking a few risks uh, while standing on stage. But it's come up with some people, so I'll scroll down. Uh, I don't know who that is. I've never seen him before. I do this a lot, and I usually get the same kinds of faces coming up. I like, that, that's not so bad, kind of stubbly man. And it's, uh, usually, usually they're a bit more bald than this. And I get, um, I've forgotten his first name. Th his surname is Thulis, he's quite a famous actor. I get him a lot as well. Uh, maybe it's this kind of intense staring into the camera. Um, I've also managed to get it to describe the, the photos and uh, why, that, well, they're, why they're kind of similar to each other. Uh, so how, let me explain how this works, because honestly, I, couldn't, I didn't know how to do this a few months ago. Um, so this is what we call a farm stack app. So it's using Fast API, React, and MongoDB. Um, and basically, the way that I'm storing photos is that they go in through the, the front end of the application, get sent to Fast, Fast API, and then behind the scenes, I'm just using an AI service um, hosted by Amazon. There's a few services out there that will do this kind of thing. Um, this just takes the image and runs it through a model called Titan Embed Image V1 that creates what's called an embedding, which I'm going to represent as just, and through the power of magic, the magic of AI. Um, an embedding, you can just think of it as being basically a number that represents this image in some way. And that gets sent back to Fast API. And then I store the image and the number um, in my database. Uh, the number is using a special in, uh, type of index, database index called a vector index. Um, there's been a few talks on this topic, so hopefully some people have kind of learned about these today. Um, so when I'm searching for a photo, it's a very similar um, kind of operation. Uh, the photo comes into the React application, posted to Fast API, and then sent off to Bedrock, where through the magic of AI, it's then converted <laughs> to embedding, an embedding number, it's then sent back to my application. And then I, I make a query against MongoDB, um, where I've stored that number, to try and find uh, a, a, a similar embedding in the database. So it just kind of looks at all the documents in my database, it kind of finds some similar numbers, and goes, well, those are the most similar numbers in the database. Um, these are also some people that, I, I quite, often, that quite often come up. Um, it all depends on kind of my facial expression and uh, how close I am to the camera generally. Um, the thing is, it's not just a number. So this is why we need the special kind of um, index. Uh, it's a 1024 dimensional vector. So it's a point in 1024 uh, dimensional space, which is a very hard thing to conceive of. So I just tend to think of it as being like a, just a blob, just a thing that I could use to store in the database and look up similar things. It, it, it tries to store, in this case, images the, the data points that it finds tries to store them together if the images are kind of similar or far apart if they're not similar. And so you can kind of find these points in space um, using these magical indexes uh, to find similar images. But the problem with the magic of AI is that because it's kind of powerful and flexible, we don't always think about all of the aspects of the way that we're using it. Uh, and one of my colleagues demonstrated this by taking a photograph of his hand, which was something I really didn't expect anybody to do. Why would somebody take a picture of their hand? And of course, it comes back with matching images. So it turns out that Chris <laughs> Evans looks a bit like my hand. Um, and then weirdly, and this happens quite a lot when you take a photo of your hand, we always get um, Mark Zuckerberg back. Um, often more than once. 
So there's something very sort of hand-like about Mark Zuckerberg. And again, this is kind of a subtlety of the application, is that it's not really doing facial recognition. It's not doing any special kind of facial recognition. It's doing image similarity. And so if you squint at these, you can see the photo on the left is kind of a Caucasian blob in the middle, and then it's kind of a dark area around the outside. And none of these is a very good match, but those are probably the closest kind of composed photos in the database. So you always need to kind of consider what, what stupid things somebody might do with your application, but also uh, aspects around bias around the data that the model's trained on and the data that you're kind of indexing and storing. Um, so that's my uh, quick demonstration of face search. This is all available online if anybody wants to have a play, uh, and it's all hosted online. Thank you very much. I think that gives new meaning to someone looks like a foot. All right, so we have Austin now presenting on, if I can juggle all this, Name Constructors. Set up. It's the HDMI, uh, there we go, maybe. Maybe I have to move that to another desktop. Uh, you're right, you're right. I'm going to unplug it for a second and turn off that. Let me see if I can find more Python so jokes in the meantime. Yeah, so go, go what do we got? Hmm. Open Apparently, if you type in import anti-gravity, it links to the XKCD comic. Who knew that? No, you, you oh, it's just me. This Reddit is really not giving me much. What is the release after Python 3.13? PyPy? Pi? Oh. I'm not looking for controversy. Anyone else? Shout out your favorite Python jokes. Code of conduct, please. That wasn't the joke. Jesus. <laughs> Back when I was learning statistics, I used to come up with uh, pickup lines. And uh, the most romantic one I ever came up with was, like a non-standard T distribution, you are unique at every parameter. <laughs> I'm married now, by the way. <laughs> All right, we ready? I think so. Let's go. All right. Um, right, so today, I'm going to talk about uh, named constructors. It's, um, in some sense, it's a dumb thing, right? It's something you've all encountered, almost certainly. And if you haven't, it, this is a good time to, to learn about it. The reason I want to talk about it is because it's good for this thing to have a name. It's not a term of art I've heard in other places, but we've used it at 60 North in our books and in our training. And it's something that we have found surprisingly helpful just to have a crystalline concept for it. So in Python, there could be only one, one con constructor. You can have one initializer, right? Unlike other languages where you can have as many as you want in, in some ways. Um, so here we have a simple class paper size, which you pass in a width and a height in millimeters, and you get a piece of paper. What size paper is that? Any paper nerds? A4, good lord. I, I know. <laughs> okay, paper nerds. Um, right, that's an A4 size piece of paper. I wouldn't have known that. But you don't want to memorize those numbers. You want a more symbolic way, a better way of writing it, expressing that you, what you want is A4. So a really common way to do it is like this, a class method called ISO A4 that returns that, um, that size piece of paper. This is what we call a named constructor. And of course, it's obvious. You see it, you go, duh, of course I would do that, and of course you would. But we don't, as far as I know, have a common term for talking about this concept and having it in our heads in in our design discussions, when we think about how to build our software, and I have found for myself, for a lot of our clients and our training people, our training students, that this really helps them keep that idea in their, in their hip pocket for when they are building their software. So that's why I want to just kind of get it out there and maybe try to give it a name, or at least have you think about giving it a name yourself. So now I can just call paper size ISO A4 and I get the right size piece of paper. And of course I can add as many of these name constructors as I want to my class. So now I have the same power as Java and C++ and other languages like that. Um, and what we find often is that this approach to designing leads us down a path to a much nicer API. I realize at some point that I can have an ISO A named constructor that just takes in the number and it gets called by ISO A5 and A4 
And then I scratch my head and say, well, I only need one of those, actually. I just need ISO A. And I can call that like this, paper size ISO A4. And that reads really, really well. I don't have to memorize the width and height in millimeters of my you know, A4, A5, A0s. I just have to leverage the fact that there's an algorithm for calculating those. Okay. So, of course, we can extend this as much as we want. Maybe we have to start selling paper in, in America, where it's the only place I can think of where they measure in inches still, paper at least. Um, from there, and I grew up with this. Um, and you can keep extending it and extending it, you know, wash, rinse, repeat, as they say. So now we can produce a US letter size piece of paper or really any size piece of paper in inches that we want just by doing some conversion math in the in inches constructor. And what you end up with is what I find to be a really nice, really readable, comprehensible, maintainable bit of code, right? I can construct my pieces of paper or whatever it is you're constructing in your domain in a really readable, straightforward way that I can understand when I see it without having to memorize magic codes, magic numbers. And there's lots of other reasons why this is a good idea and lots of other sort of applications of it, but if you've encountered this and never kind of put it in a little box and given it a name, think about that. Name constructors works as a name, but maybe you've got a better one. That's really it. Um, this is my dog. She was really hungry earlier, so I thought I'd put her out there. She's super cute, looking for dinner. Uh, I guess she got fed right after this. Um, thank you very much, and sorry for the technical problems. Thank you so much, Mark. I'm thinking, I'm sorry, I'm just thinking, okay, let's make a joke, and I can't make none, so we'll just skip right on to Luke, who's going to talk about, what are you going to talk about, Luke? HTMX. HTMX. Yes, I just wanted to hear it from Luke. Sorry. Let's warm Luke up with a round of applause as we set up. Excellent. The floor is yours. I'm just getting my notes up. All right. Uh, hello. My name's Luke. I've been working as a back end developer, mainly in Python, for a number of years. Uh, and about a year ago, I kind of started dabbling in UI. I'm, I'm going to talk about how I used HTMX to leverage my Python skills to be able to do some front-end development. So the motivation for this is um, I've been working on an app called Subbox, which is a music management service for DJs. And I wanted to get a UI up and running without learning a whole new tech stack. I didn't know any React and JavaScript, and I didn't really have any interest at the time in learning that. Uh, so I was kind of overwhelmed with choices about UI frameworks, um, and eventually I came across HTMX, which seemed to solve some of the issues I was looking at, namely not learning Java, Java, JavaScript. Um, so I think that to understand HTMX, it's good to kind of put it in context, so a bit of history about the web. Um, I'd say kind of the OG web kind of design was that you'd have your browser would make a request to a server somewhere, which would return HTML, and the browser would then render that HTML. Fast forward to kind of modern web, uh, the browser is really more of a JavaScript client, which is kind of dynamically requesting resources from a server, which typically responds in, to, in JSON, and the client um, manipulates that stores some, some state on the client side and eventually returns HTML. So HTMX really fits into that original pattern of uh, server-side rendering. The back end is returning HTML, and uh, it's kind of a, H HTMX really is a JavaScript framework, but it abstracts a lot of the JavaScript away. So as a programmer, you just have to deal with HTML integrates quite nicely with Python or, and Fast API because you can use those tools to create your backend that returns some HTML. 
So it gives rise to the Howell stack, which is HTMX and whatever you like. And in my case, that was a Python and, and Fast API. So this is a demo I've put together for the purposes of this talk. It's pretty basic, but um, you know, you've got uh, an about, you've got a sign up and login. And the magic here is HTMX is, I've kind of specified in the HTML, when I press say the sign up button, that's gonna do a request uh, to some URI route. And then the result of that will be replaced in the DOM in place, just updating the bits that need to be updated. Um, so, for example, when I navigate to this page, um, the browser is going to do a, a get request to the root, um, which in my fast API app is just this code this, uh, that's returning this home.html. And if I was to, say, use requests to request that same route and convert it to text, it would, it would, it would be this HTML code, but obviously it looks uh, it's a bit easier, easier on the eye in the browser. Um, and you see the magic HTMX script here, which uh, is enabling the HTMX features. So uh, one of the big features for HTMX is dynamic rendering, so partially updating bits of the page that I mentioned. So for example, when I click this sign up form, that button is gonna do a request to this sign up form route and replace uh, the HTML in the DOM with whatever that route returns. Uh, so yes, a bit of an overview of some of the features of HTMX. Um, yeah, you can also include parts of the DOM and pass it to the, the endpoint. For example, this sign up to the newsletter, that truthy value will, will be passed to my faster API routes. Um, yeah, uh, there are a lot of limitations, I think. Uh, not well suited for complex UI behavior, as I've slowly found out. Um, debugging in the browser is pretty limited. And now my code base largely consists of HTML templates rather than, say, JavaScript code, which I think can be also a limitation. So now I'm not migrating my app to React. <laughs> uh, if you want to find the source code, it's here. Uh, yeah, uh, it's pretty much everything. Um, it's a very basic application. Uh, don't use it for anything, production, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. I'm always very impressed when people do live demos, especially with five minutes. I'm scared of doing it when I have half an hour. Thank you. Okay, so welcome to Olga. She's gonna tell us about the art of puzzle solving. Yes. All right, thank you for having me here. Uh, so I like talking about puzzles. Um, I find it very fun, and maybe to this crowd, what will be more um, relatable is the art of problem solving. It's like preaching to the choir here. Uh, but I suppose we're at a Python conference, so I somehow have to make it related to Python, and I will in a tangential way. Uh, so first of all, um, yeah, as I said, I just want to talk about puzzles, truthfully. Uh, what do I mean when I say the word puzzle? So. To me, a puzzle when you, or, or to someone else looking at a puzzle, they go into Google, they type puzzle, and what do they get? I like to search by Google Images, they get jigsaws. This is really, really disappointing be, uh, to me because a puzzle is a lot more than that, and overall it makes me very sad. So uh, I actually want to talk about a brand of uh, types of puzzles, which is a puzzle hunt, and that's an event where uh, people, usually in teams, solve a series of puzzles, you solve one puzzle, unlock more, and so on and so forth until you um, get a prize, which is usually nothing except the satisfaction of solving puzzles. <laughs> um, think of it like a virtual escape room on steroids. Uh, so the easiest way is to show you what I mean with these uh, hunt-style puzzles. Imagine a crossword, and then imagine it without a grid. It's still a puzzle, you just reconstruct a grid, fine. Now, imagine a crossword, but, and you might see where I'm going with this. Imagine it without clues. Hmm, I promise you, uh, this is a real thing. Uh, then, what about if your grid is circular? 
What about if you have all your clues with emojis? Uh, multiple solutions. What if every single answer is actually written in Morse code? Uh, what about if your clues are regular expressions? No. Um, and all of this is without instructions. So I do not tell you that the puzzle is about Morse code or that, that it's about regular expressions. That's up to you to find out. And I will be the first to tell, to admit that some of these sound very far-fetched, but I will also tell you that all of them exist in one form or another. Each one has been designed very carefully to lead you to the solution in hopefully the most satisfying way possible. And this is what counts as citations in our community. Um, so, what are some puzzle topics? Crossword is a very base example, uh, but you can also have puzzles on wordplay, fine. Um, mastermind, uh, sorry, Wordle is just a rehashing of Mastermind. Logic, cards, custom fonts, find one of those. Uh, video and image analysis, ciphers, math, so it gets pretty technical and then you also get some pop culture. So I must admit I've become more proficient at parsing the Pokemon database than some of my work databases and my browser history is ruined, <laughs> as is every single puzzle hunter's. Uh, so to formalize a hunt-style puzzle, it is a puzzle that will give you some information. It can be in any form or topic imaginable. Uh, it will extract to an answer, which is almost always an English word or phrase. Um, and the commonality is that you have no instructions. That's up to you and hopefully your teammates to find out. Your teammates being cats, that's key. And generally, in a puzzle, you have data thing goes in, solution things goes out, which again, to this crowd, it's like preaching to the choir, so why would you even do it? Uh, then if you solve enough puzzles, then you want to write puzzles, and this leads to a lot of custom code, web development, design, nerd heaven, in a way. And a lot of lateral thinking is uh, involved, and generally, it's just really fun to open a puzzle and have feel the horror on your face as you see this, and then slowly decompose it into what it actually is, which is actually a crossword puzzle of regular expressions. And as far as I am aware, this is the original one uh, that exists. So I would like to just introduce you to this resource, the puzzlehuntcalendar.com, which is a very minimalistic website of what kind of puzzle hunt uh, are available. They go from the most devilishly complicated one, like the MIT mystery hunt um, held annually in January, uh, 70 people per team on a hopefully maximum size, 150 puzzles all weekend, to a lot more beginner friendly, which is the puzzle pint uh, might even be happening in your city. Um, so, and a lot of more hunts are online and made by independent teams, of which I'm, I'm part of one of them, and uh, some next hunts, but you can all find it on the puzzle hunt calendar as well as some resources. Um, with that, I would like to leave you with this XKCD meme about crossword constructors. It would be great, great, really great if some pop culture artists would name their album in very nonsensical strings. It would really help us a lot. So with that, thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Olga. I have one more question for you. On a scale from one to a huge round of applause, how much fun were all of these lightning talks? All right. Next one. So, we have more. So, welcome to the stage. Wait. Wait. I was trying to. I was, try, I was telling Jody, so this was the last one. And oh, Jody said, the last okay. One. And, I yes. thought you said it was the next one. No, no, this was the last one. Oh my God, we're having so many communication issues. Yes. Jeez. I think but it's not you, it's me. Oh, it's okay. So this was the last one <laughs> for today. We will have more lightning talks tomorrow and the day after. See, I didn't lie. We still have more, but tomorrow. Yes, exactly. Mm. Yes, technically correct is okay. the best kind of correct. If you want to sign up for Lightning Talks, you just have to fill a short form. You can find the link on Discord. And I will see you all tomorrow at 9? Yes. Hopefully. I, I will strongly welcome Lightning Talks that have a lot to do with cats, like Olga's, extra points. Yes. Thank extra you. Extra points guaranteed. <laughs> <laughs>